Hey, welcome to the Fairfax Sports Report here on the Fairfax Sports Network. We've got an action-packed show for you guys tonight. Upsets galore in football. We've got state tournament results from golf. We're going to talk all about field hockey, volleyball, and of course, football. We've also got an interesting interview with a region coach about some of the changes that have happened to open gym. It may not seem like a big deal with intramurals, but folks, it has a lot of implications on how your students are out there training for the upcoming winter season of basketball. Of course, before we get to that, we want to thank the wonderful, sh wonderful folks that make this show possible here on the Fairfax Sports Network. Of course, we're talking about our underwriters, CCI Screen Printing. For all your screen printing needs, 703-978-0257. Quality Care Ford Service Center, servicing all makes and models, 703-383-6299. Hey, Glow Pucks and 10 Cent Beer, a book by Connection newspaper sports writer Greg Wyshynski. Folks, of course, we mentioned we've got this great upcoming show for you. We're going to talk all about the upsets galore this week, folks. Of course, one of those big upsets would be uh, the Oakton-Centerville football game, which was won on a 70-yard kickoff return at the very end there uh, of that big Concord battle, which is going to have a lot of postseason implications, uh, especially after what happened last year with Centerville. We're going to talk all about that. An 8-2 team might be left on the outside looking in here, folks. Of course, we're going to give you our rankings for football. But before we get to our beloved sport of football, uh, we've got some field hockey that we want to talk about, Paul. Uh, the Westfield Bulldogs have been on a little bit of a skid, uh, a region powerhouse over the last couple of years. Tell us a little bit about you know, what's up with Westfield, and are they going to make a surge back in, in field hockey? Well, the undefeated Bulldogs at first um, lost to Chantilly. Chantilly is definitely a good team. So it was a nice, hard-fought 2 nothing win there for Chantilly. We thought, OK, Chantilly just outclassed them that game. Then they went ahead and lost to Oakton, right. again, that I believe you were the at. Right. And then, and then just recently lost to Edison. Not sure too much about the Edison field hockey team, but I mean, that's three straight losses in a row, right. and that's, you know, that's definitely a problem for any team. They've rebounded a bit. They beat Centerville and most recently beat McLean. So it looks like they're back on the upswing, but we're just not sure. We're at three-game losing. That can scare somebody, especially, right. you know, in the postseason, you lose, you're out. And and at the Oakton game, which is a game that went into double overtime, that Oakton won two to one. And an interesting fact, before I keep going on the, on the Westfield game, Oakton has won. Uh, at that point, they had won six out of seven games mm -hmm. in overtime this year, folks. So the Oakton field hockey team knows how to close out when those games go into extra play. Uh, that seven on seven deal where they, they put less players in. It changes the whole game. It, it changes the game and they're better with stick skills and, and, and situation type play mm -hmm. so they were able to to beat Westfield. Westfield a team I talked to coach Toll, Terry Toll at Westfield after the game and, and she said look this is a game that's gonna you know are we gonna be able to bounce back from this that's what she told her team and and um, you know I guess it looks like they haven't to this point. Um, one, one person I do want to mention on the Westfield side of, of things is uh, Jennifer Wisniewski I believe mm -hmm. I'm saying that correctly mm -hmm. A uh, goalie that I saw Great just have team. an incredible game against Oakton uh, should not be hanging her head about that mm. game at all or any of the losses they have. The girl's a brick wall back there, and, and uh, it's just good to see that, you know, even though Westfield maybe not be doing the things they've done mm -hmm. traditionally in the region, they do have some players that are exciting to watch, and uh, Oakton certainly shaping up to be a team that might make a postseason run, and of course you know it's going to be a home state tournament for the Oakton Cougars if they do get to that level. So field hockey definitely in this area is mm -hmm. off to a, to a great rise. Very interesting stuff. Folks, we want to get to golf, though. The state tournament actually just happened today, Wednesday, as we taped the show. Before uh, we got here today, we got a couple of results of what happened at the state tournament. Cox from Virginia Beach, an eastern region uh, contender down there, did take the state tournament as a team. Deep Run took second. Uh, the Oakton Cougars from the northern region were the highest placed team from this region at number three. Midlothian from Richmond took fourth, and Chantilly, uh, a powerhouse in this region for quite some time, took fifth place. Uh, it, it, might, it might interest you to know that Benari Kim, a Fairfax golfer, Mirza, uh, was the highest placed golfer uh, from this region at the state tournament. He shot a day 170, day 275 for a complete score of 145. Right, and it seems like this course that they played wasn't an easy course to play. I mean, we, we saw uh, Jake Ann from uh, right. Chantilly, who, who's been having great scores all year long up in this area, you know, competing in the northern region, go down to, the, to Portsmouth and not have a great two days. Right. So, so the 70 and the 75, they don't sound like great scores, perhaps, but at the same time, you look at, you know, you compare it to how other players who have played up here have done, and Benari Kim, like we said, 
from what we hear, the top score from the state tournament as far as the Norton region goes. Uh, another Fairfax kid is, is actually a Woodson kid, but from Fairfax City, of course, is um, Tom Andruni, and he's done a gr great job too. He was uh, he also shot a 70 on day one, and he was tied with Kim for the second place. But uh, today he had an off day, shot a 79, but still a pretty pretty good job for those two players representing the two Fairfax schools at the states. And, and the state tournament, folks, was at Bidoui Golf Course. I believe I'm saying that correctly down in um, the eastern region of of uh, Virginia. It was in, at Portsmouth, actually. Want to mention some some golfers. We do have a couple photos that we're going to uh, throw up on the screen there of some some golfers that did quite well at the the region tournament. There's Jake Ann to to uh, the left of the screen, and Danny Kim there in the middle, and Joe Irish. Uh, Jake Ann, the Chantilly golfer, mm -hmm. who at the region tournament took the individual title with a 138. Uh, Danny Kim was not far behind uh, from Oakton High School. Uh, Kim shot a 155, but it wasn't Kim who shot the, the lowest score for Oakton. It was a girl, Lauren Greenleaf, a 149, who took fourth overall individually. And Herndon's Joe Irish. Now, Herndon did not make it as a team, but Irish qualified, placing second in the Concord District, being one of the more powerful uh, districts in golf. A look at some of those players. You see Jake uh, there uh, swinging through that ball, and, and that's Jake is a guy that, that can hit long, but mm -hmm. also can place balls well. And and um, you know you've got a chance to talk with him and the coaching staff at Chantilly. You know, tell us a little bit more about Jake Ann. He's a guy that, that's definitely done well in this region for well, quite a while. Mo most definitely, he has. It, it's a little bit surprising to see that he he might not have had, have had the best two days down at the state tournament, but he blew everybody away at the regional tournament. When I to talked to Coach Seals. He, the coach at Chantilly, he said, he's a great driver, great on the approach, and he's a great putter. He has no weaknesses. Right. So I'd be interested to see what happened at the state tournament, but still a great golfer and still a great future ahead of him. And we're going we're gonna to be giving you a chance to see what these guys did, and girls, of course, did do uh, at the region tournament and at the state tournament in the a Connection newspapers. You can go online and read those stories next week as we come out with our reports of the regional golfers. A couple other people to mention, Yorktown's Thomas Schmelick. 159, this is region tournament results, low shooters for their teams. Thomas Schmelick was 159 for Yorktown. Bridget Baker shot a 151 for Langley. Danny Boss, 146 for Loudoun Valley. Aaron Snow, 153 for West Springfield. Another female out of the Vienna area, Christine Curley. She shot a 152 for Madison. And Lauren Greenleaf, of course, that we mentioned from Oakton, 149. Patrick Stoltzfus, I hope I'm saying that uh, correctly, shot a 161 for Lake Braddock. And of course, there was Jake Ann uh, at a 138. What an incredible round at Fairfax National Golf Club, which is a, a pretty difficult golf club. So um, kudos to the local golfers and for Oakton, of course, for placing the highest out of the region down at the state tournament uh, in Portsmouth. Folks, let's move on to volleyball here. You know, it's been a, a good season. A lot of teams doing really well, and some could be making a push for uh, state supremacy. Mears, I know you've got a, a preview of Lee versus West Springfield. That's got a lot of implications, does it not? That's right. Uh, it, it's a great rivalry that this uh, match has become over the years. First of all, it's a crosstown rivalry in Springfield over there, West Springfield and Lee being, uh, of course, both Springfield schools. Second of all, this year and, and the year before that, it's a great Patriot District rivalry. These two teams have been at the top of the Patriot District for a couple of years now. Uh, both teams are undefeated in the Patriot District as of now. Uh, Lee has won their not last nine games, all of them by shutout. Uh, West Springfield put a run there together of six games where they won all of them by shutout. Wow. So it's, you know, both of the coaches are saying this is the biggest game of the year for us. And even if it wasn't so competitive, even, even, if, we, even if we weren't at the top of the Patriot District together, this would be a great game for us because the most important game for us because of the crosstown rivalry. So we're looking at a very exciting game coming up on Monday at West Springfield High School. Langley, one of those teams that's still doing well in their Liberty District and competing. Uh, Paul, who's surprised you so far volleyball-wise, and, and who's the shocker, do you think, of, of your coverage area? Well, in, in, in the Concord, as, as Coach Jim Boer of Westfield told me, any football player, any football coach will tell you it's no piece of cake in the Concord. <laughs> Absolutely. And so definitely, right now, Westfield is the cream of the crop. Their only loss comes to Deep Run, who you just mentioned the golf, coverage and they play them first game of the year in a, in a tournament and they'll play them again uh, late in late, late October so we'll see with them. Uh, Centerville Chantilly it's a toss-up. Centerville beat Chantilly three to two when they matched up so it's pretty much what you're looking at Westfield, Centerville, Chantilly they're all fighting for it and it looks like Westfield's going to come out, come out on top there. 
Herndon's a talented team in that Concord district, but you know it's it's a tough district to really no piece battle. Of cake. And so, like you said, no piece of cake, and we'll be looking for some of those teams. I know Stonebridge had a talented team out Definitely. from Loudon; uh -huh. they lost a lot. Um, but that's a team that could make a, a, a push there in the, the Liberty District. So, I'd like to see how those districts uh, shape up in the upcoming weeks. Um, pretty soon here, we're going to get our guest on. Uh, McLean basketball coach Drew Murphy is going to be joining us now. We're going to be talking a little bit about what's going on in the intramural basketball scene uh, in the region. I know at home, folks, you're probably scratching your head thinking, well, they don't cover junior varsity sports, but they cover intramurals. Well, let me just explain before we move on and, and, and ask Coach Murphy a couple questions. Uh, the open gym sessions are sessions that allow students, not just basketball players, to keep in shape during the fall season, to play basketball, Many of them are basketball players and like to stay in shape for the upcoming winter season. So what's been happening is uh, a lot of them have been coming back to school um, after the time that has been allotted, a two and a half hour period for intramurals to play at open gyms. Because gym time is so limited, they've been forced to come back after the allotted two and a half, period, two and a half hour period after the bell rings at school. Um, that has now been altered. So things are going to be changing, Coach. Coach, welcome to the show. Hey guys, how you doing? Hey, just wanted to pick your brain a little bit about some of these changes. I was at the Northern Region Council meeting this week and a vote was passed by a 15 to 9 vote by the DSAs and the principals here in the region um, that's going to be making some changes to the intramural basketball season and to the intramural gym season, I guess you would say. Right. Something that's going to have a lot of implications for how students prepare um, not only for basketball season, but for other sports by using that time. Mm -hmm. How has it changed what coaches in the region have, have had to do now? Well, with the, with the advent of volleyball, now we have volleyball coming in the fall, um, there's not a lot of gym time. So what coaches have had to do is try and be creative with their intramurals and, you know, to get kids in there. So guys have been coming back at night, like you were talking about, or um, some guys started to have intramurals in the morning, and I guess what the region, the, the region council just decided to do last week was to approve that and to make it okay for people to have intramurals in the morning. Um, one of the issues was, has always been that intramurals have to be open to everybody. So having things after the two and a half hour period that you're talking about at night or in, even sometimes in the morning, um, people were concerned that it would be excluding kids who rode the bus to school generally. So. Um, you know, coaches are concerned because they want to get their kids in there. They want to get um, guys in shape um, and, and make sure guys are playing and getting ready for the season. And, uh, you know, with volleyball and things like that, there just isn't a lot of gym space. And, and Coach, I believe, you know, after talking to a lot of coaches in the region for this story, a story, by the way, that you can read on the ConnectionNewspapers.com, um, after talking to a lot of coaches, mm -hmm. a lot of them mentioned, you know, look, you know, at the Northern Region Council meeting, it was brought up that, you know, coaches were using this time as out of season practice time right, and right. you know a lot of those a lot of those things were being thrown around quite loosely mm -hmm. and you're the president of the Northern Region Coaches Association for basketball right is that really a problem in our region um, I don't know that I would say it's a problem I mean are there guys out there who are perhaps bending the rules a little bit I, I mean I would be probably be safe to say that I don't think this was prompted necessarily by uh, a specific incident or anything like that. I think it's been an ongoing issue as far as intramurals and what we can do. Um, people throw around the out of season practice uh, catchphrase a lot, um, but I think it, this 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 thing that the region was doing wasn't necessarily prompted, like I said, by a specific incident. I mean, guys are just concerned with how we can get gym time for intramurals, how we can get kids involved, how we can get kids prepared for for the upcoming season. So, uh, you know. Like I said, I don't think it was a, a specific incident. I know I've been in the county for a long time as an assistant now as a, as a head coach, and it's something that's, that comes up every few years. And I think the real problem is with these, with these uh, rules that we have, what, number one is how, how, we, how do we enforce the rules? How, how, do people, uh, how do we make people accountable for them? I know the Coaches Association, uh, certainly my view is we're not out to police other people. Right. Um, we want to make sure that our stance has really been we want to make sure people know what the rules are. We want to get that information out there um, so guys know what the rules are. I mean, I don't think it's a rampant issue as far as guys, uh, you know, purposely breaking the rules and having out-of-season practice. And, and Coach, what about auxiliary gyms? Is that, are those full also during this time period? Or I, 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 I see that, you know, there's a huge, you got a huge regular gym and an auxiliary gym. Are these all packed? 
Well, it, it depends on the school, of course. I mean, okay. like at McLean, we're really fortunate because we have a really nice auxiliary gym. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when the volleyball people are doing their thing after school, we have a place that we can have intramurals after school a couple of days a week. In fact, we split time. The girls have it a couple of days and the boys have it a couple of days. So we're really, really fortunate. Actually, at some of the, the larger schools, like a Chantilly, um, you know, they don't have an auxiliary gym. So when, when volleyball practice or whatever else is going on in the fall, they're really – squeeze for gym time so i mean it, it's a it's a school to school type of thing but it, you're actually very fortunate if you have an auxiliary gym and then of course you know with all the other activities that go on in the fall even sometimes still the auxiliary gym is being used um and you know certainly the volleyball team has precedence it's their season i mean certainly if during the basketball season i would be upset if someone said well you need to give up gym time so that volleyball can do intramurals i mean so i mean it, it, in fairness to them you know, they're the priority. It's their season. So having an auxiliary gym is definitely a luxury for, for certain schools. Mm-hmm. Coach, uh, could you tell me a little bit about what kind of effect this is going to have on the players, on the basketball players themselves as they try to prepare themselves for the upcoming season and even looking further than that, perhaps a little bit on their possible college careers? Well, I think one of the, one of the issues is, and I don't, I don't, just speaking for myself, and I think there are probably some coaches that agree with this, Kids today aren't as likely, I don't think, to go out to the park or the playground and play in this area, um, maybe like they were even when I was playing back in the, in the late 80s, early 90s. So kids are really looking for the school to provide them for a place to play. So I think that it's going to be, you know, you might have to spend extra time at the beginning of the actual season doing conditioning and, and getting kids ready to play, you know, so you can prevent injuries and things like that. So it, it, it has an effect. I mean, certainly the less kids are playing, the less ready they're going to be when the season starts. So um, I think it could have long-range effects, too, if a kid is looking for, uh, you know, college opportunities and things like that. I know, you know, if you have a Division One type of prospect, the fall is a great time for Division It's an open period for, for Division One coaches to come and look at kids. There's only certain times and places they can do that, and a lot of times that is open gym time that they can come and do that. So, uh, sometimes maybe those opportunities aren't there for a kid if, if there's no gym space available because the college coach is restricted as to what he can come and watch. An open gym is one thing that he can come and watch, so it could have long-range effects, certainly. And one thing, Drew, from talking to some coaches throughout the region um, this week, I mean, you know, one thing that you did mention, you said you didn't want to be a policeman mm-hmm. and going into gyms and, and saying, you know, are you running your open gym correctly? Right. A lot of these guys have the feeling that, you know, directors of student activities throughout the county should be policing that on their own. Sure. And not only uh, is this a blanket rule that is only going to be policing the coaches that are really actually doing things the right way. I sure. mean, if someone's going to, if a coach is going to try to have an out-of-season practice, and I quote Coach Gary Hall from Herndon High School, who said, maybe I'm naive and don't think that there's someone out there with a whistle on their neck and running practices. Sure. If they are doing that, they are probably at a health club or outdoors. Are they right. dumb enough to do this at their own gym? <laughs> right. I, mean, is right. That, I mean, isn't that hitting the nail on the head? Right. Yeah, I, I would agree with Gary on that. I mean, if, if, somebody is, if someone is uh, convinced that that's what they need to do is to have an illegal practice, bottom line is they're going to do it. And, and, and Gary's right. They're going to go somewhere where they think they're not going to get caught doing it. And uh, they're not going to be trying to use their own gym for that. I mean, that would be absurd to, to do that. Um, but, yeah, the, the athletic directors, activities directors are the ones who should be policing this. And, and in fairness to them, I mean, they have a lot of other things to do, too. I mean, it's really it's a difficult problem because, you know, if someone wants to have an illegal practice, it should, should the activities director really be, you know, scouring the community looking for his coach who's doing something wrong? I don't think so. They have other things to do. So it's, it's a difficult situation. And, and you know, where, we, where we're going to end up with this, I don't know. I mean, the other problem is, too, being a Fairfax County coach, the rules in Fairfax County are a little different than they are in, say, Arlington County. And right. they're certainly different in the northern region than they are, say, in the central region. So, I mean, it has statewide implications for, you know, because the rules aren't consistent throughout the state of Virginia. So there are teams uh, elsewhere who might have advantages that, say, we don't have. So it's definitely an issue been over 20 years since a state title has come to the northern region That's right. and, and the, you know other regions don't have this rule per se and, and it's one of those things that is certainly an advantage not only to other schools in the state but for individual players looking to play and get showcased um, this is now another advantage for private school coaches to lure kids away from 
the northern region with more gym time. Coach Murphy, hey, we appreciate the time. Uh, thanks for the insight. We'll definitely be in touch. I right, appreciate it, guys. Thanks, Drew. Okay. Thanks, Coach. So some expert analysis there, guys, from a coach who's got to deal with some of these things. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, they're looking to get their kids in the gym. And, and something Drew said earlier to me this week when, when I got a chance to talk to him about it, um, it's not necessarily the coaches chasing these kids to get them in the gym. Mm -hmm. These kids are chasing the coaches so they can get into the gym. I mean, you know how expensive it is for a health club membership yeah. to get in there and play against a 45-year-old man with elbow pads and knee pads who's, like uh, a coach told me this year, or during this story, uh, trying to relive his heyday, <laughs> plowing a 17-year-old through the wall for a rebound and jeopardizing that kid's career. So a lot of these things, I understand why the rule was put into place to stop um, certain things from going mm -hmm. on. It just seems like, you know, one bad apple spoils the bunch for everybody. I'd rather see the region go after the coaches that are doing things incorrectly rather than hurting some of the coaches who are doing things the right way, Mirza. I, I certainly understand the issue of priority, like uh, Coach Murphy was saying. If, you know, it's volleyball season right now, and if they need the gym, they get the gym. But at the same time, you don't want to, you know, kill these kids' opportunities, you know, if you're a Division I prospect, to go to a Division I school, you know, if you can only be seen during open gym time. Right. And he, as he was saying, you know, this, this might be their only place where they could get that kind of um, exposure. So I've, Killing I'm, scholarships. Right. And, I mean, like, like you said, and like he said, there's an understanding as to why this rule was put into place, but at the same time, maybe there was a better solution to it. Absolutely. Now, w w w was this the Northern Region Council thinking this stuff was going on, kind of maybe hearing something? Do they have any proof this was going on out of season practice? From the reporting that I've done, it was um, one of those things where phone calls were coming in from parents um, to administrative higher-ups. Mm -hmm. um, the administrative higher-ups then asked the council to redefine the rule that's on the books in the region. And the wording of the rule, and this is all literally semantics here, mm -hmm. the wording of the rule was, before this, an extension of the day. Okay. But what happened was coaches were and schools were interpreting that in different ways. Mm -hmm. They were extending the day very later, after the day was over. Mm -hmm. And um, now it's an extension of the day before school, two and a half hours, or after the bell rings for two and a half hours. They put that no, hour in there now? No more coming back to school. Okay. And that's going to hurt a lot of kids who, by the way, and, and I don't want to get into this soapbox, I don't want to get on my soapbox about mm -hmm. America here, but, mm -hmm. you know, uh, crime. You know, kids getting in involved into things they shouldn't be getting involved in, shouldn't we be keeping them off the streets, mm -hmm. per se, and away from, you know, certain bad elements and in the gym? I mean, who are you really hurting with this rule? That's the problem I have with it. Like we said, we understand why it was done, but mm -hmm. I, I don't know necessarily if this is solving a problem. I think it might be creating um, a couple more. Folks, we're going to move on to some football here. Uh, we've got about a good 40 minutes here to talk here we go. solid football. And we know so many of you folks at home are just – waiting to hear about all these upsets that happened this week. We want to jump right into, of course, the most exciting district in this region and one that has a lot of playoff implications. Of course, we're talking about the Concord District. And we have some standings from the Concord District, guys, that we're going to throw up on the screen here for oh, you. Oh, my goodness. Hey, who's that up top? Someone that we know very well in our top 10 poll. Uh, Westfield, 6-0 and overall and undefeated in the district, as is Robinson, also undefeated with a 4-1 and record. There's Chantilly at 4-1, excuse me, 4-1, and, and with their win over Oakton, they're 1-0. They're coming off the bye this week. There's Oakton splitting it up at 1-1 one one in the district with a gigantic upset win over Centerville. We'll talk more about mm -hmm. that when we get a chance. 3-2 overall are the Cougars, and then there's Fairfax at 0-1, 1-4. One, one, one Centerville, a team that was slated to do so many good things at 0-2, 4-2 overall, Herndon 0-2, 2-3. And and Surprising to see Centerville and Herndon guys at the bottom of the Concord District standings. Well, what's really surprising, I mean, Centerville had a disastrous two weeks. It was just first losing to Westfield, now we're, we're starting, to, starting to learn how good Westfield is, and then losing to Oakton, who, who Chantilly beat, which is kind of confusing, we don't know what's going on there. It's just dropped them from, they were on the top of our, our you know, connection top 10 poll, right. and they've fallen so far. And what I believe is a problem is how easy their schedule was before they got to the Concord District. They were killing teams. Three mercy rules of the first four games, and then all of a sudden, playing teams like Westfield and playing teams like Oakton, I don't think they are prepared. Absolutely, I totally agree with that. You know, a lot, of, a lot of teams, and I don't accuse Centerville of this, but a lot of teams want wins early. It builds confidence. Centerville and Coach Mike Skinner have never taken the no. easy route, but I'd say this 
year, the level of their competition that they played not being up to par at what they should be mm -hmm. hurt Centerville in the long run because once they get into their Concord district, which has been described as a gauntlet, a meat grinder, I mean, you, no you put you're no piece <laughs> of cake, you put your label on it, folks, it hurts a team like Centerville who plays that easier schedule for the preseason, whereas you have a team like Oakton who plays a Stonebridge and some of those tougher teams mm -hmm. that comes in a little bit more prepared. Uh, they won on a 70-yard kickoff return on Monday as games were postponed mm -hmm. from Friday's rain to Monday. 70-yard kickoff return from Oakton's Orlando Bryant, a guy that's quickly making his name for himself after Keith Payne left for graduation in UVA this year. Nobody knew who was going to take the reins at the running back position. They've done it by committee. Orlando Bryant really making a name for himself over there. Uh, I believe Stephen Harris, also a, a new quarterback now, as Stephen Puneris was injured. Mm -hmm. in this game or before this game and had to, to took, leave took himself out of the took game himself out and, and no slight to him he did it for the good of the team so very selfless so move. coach Thompson was very happy with that selfless move uh, Mirza the Robinson Rams slowly rising steady but surely off the bye slowly rising that's right we were just talking about Centerville struggling over the last two weeks let's not forget this week they got Robinson it doesn't get any easier Robinson a per perennial powerhouse Questions were asked, can they replace the players that they lost last season? Yes, they can. Because, you know, they beat Herndon two weeks ago. I mean, it, it was a no contest in the second half. 38 to 17, they just flew to this victory. They're coming up fresh off of a bye week. They're rested. Centerville's gotten beaten up over the last couple of weeks. It's gonna be a tough one for Centerville to beat them. It should be anyways, because it's Robinson. But here is Robinson coming off fresh. So it's gonna be a very exciting game. So Go ahead, Paul. But Centerville must be half and mad, so it's going to be a very interesting game. And, and you know, Centerville, we're going to get a chance to show you now that we've talked about both Centerville and Robinson. We want to show you our FSN Madden preview of the week. Uh, FSN will be at, of course, the Centerville versus Robinson football game. It's going to have a lot of playoff implications. Centerville holding on to its playoff life uh, at Robinson, like Mears has said, coming off of the bye uh, this week. Robinson Rams are rested and ready while these Centerville Wildcats are coming off two straight losses to Westfield, their rival, and of course Oakton on a last minute disaster. And you see uh, Tim Meyer, the quarterback there, lining up number four, who's spreading out and looking at his receivers. Uh, and you've got his brother coming out of the backfield, Mike Meyer, a little play action fake. And oh, that's, a, that's an interception for the young sophomore quarterback at Robinson. Hasn't had many of those this year, but they're giving Centerville's defense a little bit of play here as, as they've gotten to make a couple of plays this year and have made names for themselves. Uh, the Centerville Wildcats defense should have an impact in this. You see Van Chu lined up under center here, and we see Basaliga to the right and Basaga to the left. Davis in the backfield. Davis is a guy that's really made a name for himself uh, here on the toss. The guy's just got moves on moves. He can really push the pile. Davis is a guy that's made a big impact. You see Chu there at quarterback, guys. He's a guy that's a receiver. Earlier this year, they kept him in there for the first couple of games. Uh, Philip Dunnigan has now, I believe, taken over that role predominantly. I think they're going to be splitting a little bit of time, but, but Dunnigan really making a name for himself now as a quarterback. And Chu, uh, going back to his playmaker status, you see another interception here in this, in this heavy defensive matchup. Uh, Robinson, always known for their defense, going to be coming out of their own end zone here. Still nothing, nothing. We've got... Uh, there's, there's Tim Meyer with the handoff and, and, you know, getting pushed out of bounds on fourth down there is the ball carrier for the Robinson Rams. Going to see Centerville here getting another shot at some offense with Chu in the backfield. We talked about Davis and Basaga and Basalaga to the right. There's the pitch out. Davis look, he really has that good stiff arm. He's also, he's a powerful guy, but he's got, he's got juke Leader moves power. too, you know. So he's a guy that's really made a name for himself in that Concord district. Some of the premier running backs also being um, you know, Mike Meyer, as you see in the backfield lined up. The older brother of the man that just passed him the ball, Tim Meyer. Um, good family rivalry here in the northern region. Herndon coach Tommy Meyer being their uncle and uh, successful Dan Meyer who's won three state championship titles, also the principal at Robinson Secondary is their father. So a lot of history there with the Myers. There's the look to David Leite on the out on the left side from Tim Meyer, who's really coming along as a young sophomore quarterback there at Robinson. Uh, you see, of course, the Rams are going to be spreading it out a little bit, but you know they're a hard-nosed running football team. 
Mirza got a chance to see as we see Meyer here in our run up the sideline. Mirza, he's not the only guy that can come out of the backfield for Robinson. No, and I want to talk a little bit about this guy that we were talking about, guys stepping up for Robinson, Winston Fox, a sophomore. You know, you don't only have Tim Meyer as a sophomore as quarterback, you have a guy that's receiving passes and running ball for him. Over the last two games, Fox against the plane, one, one pass caught for 60 yards, and that was a touchdown. Against Turden, two passes caught for 77 yards and a touchdown, and that was a 29-yard touchdown. You saw the Robinson Rams fans there who are going to be excited for this game. Robinson keeping its playoff hopes alive. Robinson's a team. Uh, right now, they've got the sixth best power point rating in the region, and you see Davis there with the spin move. He's got those moves, Paul. You've seen him on the field. Um, what have you seen from Davis, and do you believe that he can be very effective in this game where Robinson, you know they're always going to be bringing the defense? The thing about Davis, very fast breakaway speed, and with this improving Centerville offensive line, once Davis gets past that line, he's got that breakaway speed, and that's where you see 60-yard touchdowns, 70-yard touchdowns. It's going to be interesting. I think he's going to have a big game against Robinson. We see Basiliga there with a nice tan. He must have been out uh, <laughs> this week. Tanning in the nice weather. Uh, coming up on Davis here is going to be looking for the end zone. You know he always is. He's a guy that, like you just said, Paul, has got that breakaway speed once he hits the hole. But guys, as we see our Madden FSN Madden preview of the week there, uh, what's going to happen to these Centerville Wildcats? Are they going to be able to bounce back, Paul? Um, I think so. I think they have a good shot at beating Robinson. Robinson's one main test came out of out of region out of out of region uh, test there, and you know C Centerville's had their two. I think they. I, I believe that I thought Westfield was going to be their wake up call. Yeah. But you know, then Oakton. I think that they're they're going to have a tough week tough week of practice, and I think they can pull it out. I'm you know we'll see. Mirza. I'd be wary of those Rams. I mean Centerville's coming in with a lot of pressure on them. They know if they lose this one. Playoff implications are huge for them. I know in Concord, everybody's been killing everybody else off except for Westfield. And Robinson hasn't gotten into the Concord district that much yet. But, uh, you know, coming into the game against Robinson, having to win, Coach Bendor for Robinson is going to know that. And he's going to play to that. And he's going to, you know, he's, I'm sure he's scouted, scouted Centerville very well. And they're going to be prepared for this game. So, I don't know. I mean, if I had to say who was going to win it, I'd say Robinson. But it's going to be such a good game. And speaking of good games, I was at a good game two weeks ago. We haven't done a show since, mm -hmm. you know, two, a couple weeks ago. Uh, I was at the Oakton-Chantilly game, and Chantilly shut out Oakton. Chantilly is a defensive-heavy team that's also got a very capable quarterback. And, mm -hmm. of course, Nate Warwick, who was on the show with us with Coach Mike Lolly, that team has just really surprised some people. They know it. They're playing with a chip on their shoulder. They beat Oakton, uh, a shutout win where they've got some guys. Austin Morris is a guy that's in the secondary there. He can light you up across the middle. You don't want to go across the middle on a guy like that. Um, and, and, you know, beating Oakton obviously is going to do worlds of things for PowerPoint implications for Chantilly, which is right now in third place in this region for PowerPoints. You've got um, your Westfields at the top with 24.5 PowerPoints, Stonebridge right behind, 23.6. Then there's Chantilly with 21.8 and Oakton right behind with 21.4 power points. Those power points have a lot to do, as we see here in the late parts of the season. They really start to develop with teams upsetting other teams. They're getting rider points, that sorts of, you know, those sorts of things with power points. That's going to have a lot of implications. And like last year, I really believe a good Concord team is going to get left out of the playoff scene. I believe Chantilly, more than in other years, is going to have a lot to say about who's coming out of the Concord. Speaking of who's coming out of the Concord, let's talk a little bit about Westfield. 6-0 and start, Paul. I mean, what can you say about the Bulldogs? Well, what I've, what I've seen so far, is, as you've seen also, is you know you got Glennon. Whitmer has been the person for them coming out of that wide receiver because he, he used to be a quarterback. Right. He knows how to help a quarterback like Glennon, who's still young, a junior, and is ten, tends to make some mistakes. And, and Whitmer can definitely go out and grab the ball that was overthrown, underthrown. Definitely their threat in Tabit, of course, and actually Kennedy we saw um, can actually make some plays at running back. So it's surprising thinking that coming in that Westfield was so young on offense right. and they don't have these offensive threats. We didn't because Royster was gone, but we, we're seeing you know three or four guys coming out and being legitimate offensive threats for Westfield. And then another thing that we haven't been talking about, focusing on this young offense, is the fact that their Westfield defense is amazing. Right. Well, they, they are shutting people down and giving that offense a chance to you know, 
put their points on the board, get up, you know, three touchdowns, and then they can glide through the second half. So very interesting. I was at the Westfield shutout win over Herndon mm -hmm. on, um, on Monday, and I'll say this. Yes, the defense has played well lately, mm -hmm. and I believe that they've learned a lot as the season has progressed, but they were not playing well early in the season. I saw them against Langley, uh, and they did not look good. Langley really put the hurt on Westfield up front. If you have the big dogs up front, mm -hmm. you can really put the hurt on them with the line. So um, I saw Westfield do some good things against Herndon. They've grown up. I talked to Coach Verbanek. He said we found our identity. So mm -hmm. also want to send our shout-out to uh, David Crutchko, um, who was recently let out of the hospital, was a uh, receiver that broke his leg in the Langley game. I was there on the sidelines watching that. He's had a couple of surgeries. He's a junior. And according to Coach Verbanek, he might have a shot at getting a chance to play That'd his senior great. year. Oh, so okay. he's only a junior. He's definitely not going to make it back this year. But his senior year, he should have another shot. Guys, let's move on quickly um, to Herndon. They've fallen very hard from the beginning of the year. Uh, I have to say it, and I know I'm going to hear about it from parents and folks out there. They've underachieved a little bit with the 43 seniors they returned. Um, but, you know, it's unfortunate that they haven't had a chance to really harness uh, the year that many believe they thought they would have with so many uh, returners and so many people uh, coming back to that squad. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want to – people who don't understand the game and might have been at the homecoming loss against Westfield might want to blame the quarterback who mm -hmm. was sacked several times. But you can't blame a guy who's – killing himself on every play to avoid the rush. Mm -hmm. The line does not give him a chance to throw. Zay Lopez has not had an opportunity to do what he's been able to do. Turnovers have also hurt the, the Herndon Hornets. Chris Thompson, a senior running back, is now injured with an ankle, um, only played a little bit. Desmond Sifu, a young guy, now carrying the ball for Herndon. Um, you know, they had some fumbling issues. So we'll see what Herndon is able to do. I want to get a chance to show you what we believe the top ten is at the Connection newspapers every week. We put this on our pigskin page that you can find in your local Connection newspapers. Stonebridge right at the top there with 40 points. They've taken over at the number one spot. Westfield, 36 votes. Robinson, Edison, Chantilly, Oakton, Centerville, Annandale, Lee, and Lake Braddock was not ranked before this week, as was Oakton, who fell off the map uh, after a loss to Chantilly. They get back on after finding out how good Chantilly well, really is, uh -huh. and of course, they get back on with that big win over what many thought would be a state title contender in Centerville. Still a lot to be found out about these teams. You think usually by week seven, you know who's who. I think what we found out this year is, unlike other years, we've got more questions on our hands than answers about who's who. We, we just, we still don't know. And that's, that's the response to most things. We just don't know. We're going to see how it plays out. Hey, in the Liberty, guys, we've got a really big race. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we've got a really big race. You didn't get that. Stonebridge is running oh, away with okay, it, guys. I'm sorry. Okay, the Stonebridge running. <laughs> Stonebridge is running away with it in the Liberty District. We want to show you the Liberty District standings. Um, Stonebridge up there at the top, undefeated, untouched by anybody. Um, they've got, of course, um, they've got a. Yeah, there they are. Uh, they've got a five and zero record. Um, Woodson only above Stonebridge right now because you know they're three and zero in the district. Mm -hmm. and Stonebridge has only won two games in the district, but trust me, Stonebridge will uh, will do what we know they're going to do. Woodson hasn't really beaten the toughest teams to get there. Then you've got your Madisons, Marshalls, Langley, South Lakes, a sleeper, I believe, in the in the region in the district. McLean and Jefferson. Just, just look for a second at um, I have this in front of me. The rest of Stonebridge's schedule: Madison, McLean, Woodson, Marshall, South Lakes. I mean, I can definitely see a scenario where they go 10-0 in the regular season, and it looks like they're going to do that the way they've been playing. Absolutely. Mirza, Woodson, world beaters, or have they just, have they just gotten by? Uh, you know what? I, I can't really answer that question. <laughs> I just don't at, know. At the beginning of the year, you know, I was thinking if they get back to their 3-7 and seven mark from right. last year, they're going to have a successful season. Right. They're already past that mark uh, with a very young team, first-year head coach. They're obviously doing something right. Uh, I saw them play against Fairfax where, you know, they just got by. But Fairfax is a Concord team. Uh, it was 6 nothing. great defense. Uh, they're a young team, so they're going to be around for a couple more years. Are they going to keep winning this year? I wouldn't be surprised. You know, every year, every, every week, they seem to get away with it somehow. So. Yeah, they, they, they won a game against South Lakes two weeks ago that was, uh, they won after getting down 21-7 to in the first half. They came back and, and won when they, they scored 40 points on the night. Um, they, of course, took over from w what South Lakes was doing, which was turning the ball over four times in the second half. But um, it's, it's been 
uh, an up and down year in the Liberty, of course, underneath the one that's running away with it, which is Stonebridge. Um, speaking of up and down, Langley, I just can't put my finger on what they're able to do. I mean, uh, they, they started a new quarterback this week. Um, they did some things. Paul, you saw them. I saw uh, what, them. What do you think of the Saxons? Well, I was impressed by them. I honestly was impressed by They were playing Stonebridge. We've been talking how good Stonebridge is. And you also mentioned how, how what Langley did to Westfield. The thing about Langley is they are huge up front. They're big. They're strong. They're talented. They can run on anybody. Right. They, they even ran on Stonebridge. Right. So they, they, it's all about, you, know, you saw with, with Zay Lopez getting sacked so much, it's all about that offensive line, honestly, because you know, I used to be an offensive lineman. <laughs> I understand the importance of that line. And when you have some big, strong boys like, like, like Langley does, you'll be fine. I want to mention Marshall, a team that has just done in, incredible. I mean, what can you say about a team that two years ago uh, hadn't won a game, didn't win a game, and then um, here they are now, four and one, one and one in the district. They've got a 19.0 power point total. That may be the highest for Marshall in several years. Uh, Marshall won a game over Langley um, recently before their bye week. Um, they're coming off the bye this week, so two weeks ago they beat Langley eight to seven on a two-point conversion. They were down hmm. seven nothing in the third quarter, and Marshall coach J.T. Bittison, they scored. Marshall coach J.T. Bittison. Instead of tying the game in the third wow. quarter, called for a two-point conversion. Now, you never want to question a high school player. I just don't believe that the kicking game is what it needs to be at Marshall. I believe that had a little bit more to do with it than, than JT right. being a gambler yeah. there on the sidelines. So uh, it, it went in their favor. They, got, they punched it in there for the, uh, uh, on the run, and, and they got the two-point conversion and, and the win. So their defense obviously held strong in the rest of the game. Um, speaking of guys that can punch it in the end zone, though, you got a guy over at South Lakes in Gay by Toka who has scored 13 touchdowns mm. in the last three games. This guy scored six, then five, and then two this past week. So his progression has gone down. <laughs> no, the guy is incredible. I mean, he's got, well, here he is. We'll see a picture of him here against Madison. They lost this game, but Itoka took the third, the third play from scrimmage on Monday for a 70-yard 70, 70 run. Uh, up the middle, cutting back left and right, and, and the guy's just got incredible speed. He's been electronically timed at a combine a year ago, mind you, a year ago, at 4.540 speed. Now, you'd say, okay, that's not bad, but by hand clock, which is different than electronic, mm -hmm. he's been timed at 437. 437. The kid is a little guy, he, as you can see in that picture. He's a little guy, he's got burst of speed. Um, he can cut back and forth. He doesn't go down easily. Usually these little guys that are just fast, they just go down when you mm -hmm. hit them. This guy keeps, he actually moves the pile at his size. I've never seen anything like that. So he's a guy that's getting some looks now from some D1s, you know, not the highest level because of his size. His mm -hmm. size hurts him. So uh, he's going to get a couple of looks from a couple of colleges. I like to see how that pans out for him. He's a senior, quiet guy, uh, good grades, just a, a guy that you definitely want on your football it's, team as a leader. It's interesting to see. You know, you, you Talk about how, how many touchdowns he's had. One and four record for South Lakes. What's, right. what's going on there? And that's the thing. South Lakes has is been troubled by certain things. For example, they should have won the Woodson game. They mm -hmm. turned. They had a big lead at half. They turned the ball over four times. You know, I, and by no fault to their coach, they're undisciplined. I mean, they it's it, and you don't want to say that about a team because then it falls back on the staff, and you think they're taking a shot at the staff. No, it's just that a lot of these guys because. They don't play football. They haven't played football before playing for this team. They don't understand the game. They don't know where the ball is going to be, mm -hmm. those sorts of things, because they have uh, problems with how many players they have on their team. They only have 40 players on the roster. You're picking up kids off the street and basically putting them in a mm -hmm. uniform, and that's going to cause turnovers. So, um, you know, they have some skilled players that can do some things, and Amir, uh, excuse me, Gabe Itoka is one of those players. Um, don't want to talk too much about McLean, but you know they're off to a pretty rocky start mm -hmm. now, 0 and 5, and um, I believe they've only scored about 18 points on the season in five games. So we'll look to see McLean um, hopefully revamp. Get, hopefully and, get one of those wins right, this, this season. Right, it would be good to see them get a win. Although they play Marshall this week, and Marshall's definitely on the rise. Want to post our top 10 again, folks, and give you a chance to see where your favorite team ranks in the Connection Newspaper's top 10 poll. Of course, you see the Stonebridge Bulldogs. It's a bulldog-heavy top 10 poll as the Westfield 
Bulldogs and Stonebridge Bulldogs are up at the top. Westfield go 10-0 also. Westfield could go 10-0, <laughs> but hey, I've got them pegged to lose to Oakton this week. So You don't know in the concrete, just don't know. I'll probably have to eat my words. I don't know. It's just an incredible concord. Uh -huh. You never know what's going to happen, like you say, Paul. Edison, a team we'll get a chance to talk, to, talk about a little bit as we uh, creep down our list of districts here. Chantilly, Oakton, Centerville on the fall, Annandale on the rise, and hey, it's a fun Patriot district with Lee there. That's a team we're going to get a chance to talk about as we move on to the Patriot District, want to post our impossible trivia. Uh -oh. Of course, it's impossible. Makes me feel stupid. Which team was the first Division VI state title winner for the Northern Region? Division VI, first ever. Robinson? Here's a, would you wager a guess? Hmm. I'd, have, I'd have to say Robinson, too, because they used to be in the Patriot. Division six, the first Division six state title winner would be T.C. Williams. In 1987, they, they beat Hampton, a team that's now a Division five team. They beat Hampton 10 to six. Hampton, of course, uh, beat Stonebridge in the state final last year. They've won, I believe it's 14 straight state titles in football or 14 altogether or some, mm -hmm. some crazy number. Um, anyway, folks, we want to post our Patriot District standings. The Patriot District has been more fun Mirza than it has been in several years. I don't think anyone's seen a Patriot district with so much parity um, as this district. We keep talking about Concord, about people knocking each other off. The Patriot district is the same way this year. We have Annandale up there um, undefeated in the district, although they are 3-2 and two overall. You got Lee also undefeated at 2-0. and oh. West Potomac right behind them, and nobody would have guessed that two weeks ago that West Potomac would be 2-0. and oh. Lake Braddock at 2-2. Two and two. They've already played four district games. I don't think we've seen that anywhere else. South County at one and two in the district, but three and two overall. D.C. Williams one and two, three and three overall. West Springfield, a team that we featured heavily in our preseason uh, preview, zero oh and two in the district. A great game that we need to talk about later on. And Hayfield, zero oh and three and zero oh and six overall. Still hurting from South County opening up and the numbers issues. Okay, so Mirza, if I'm a Northern Region football fan and I like the Patriot District, what am I, what am I Googling this week? What, what word am I Googling this week? Offense, <laughs> certainly not defense. Uh, I mean, folks, this, this is, you're gonna think basketball when I tell you the score right. of the West Potomac, West Springfield game played this weekend. West Potomac beat West Springfield 81 to 74 in four overtimes. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What did you say the score was, Mirza, for those West at home? Potomac beat West Springfield 81 to 74 in four overtimes. In the a finals, game. The, the score at the end of the four quarters of a football game <laughs> was 53 to 53. All right, before we let you get too ahead of, of the analysis and all of this, tell us a little bit about the game. And, and I know it set some records as well statewide. I believe it's the highest combined scoring game uh, in the history of the state. Right. Uh, let me give you some other uh, stats about it. 1,400 total yards from both teams, 21 touchdowns, four overtimes, like I said. Uh, West Potomac unofficially uh, was able to put up 716 yards of offense. Meanwhile, you had uh, West Springfield with 675 yards of wow, offense. Not too shabby. Um, another great, just trivial thing, West Springfield was up 50 to 24 in the second half to let it end at 53-53 before going to overtime. Uh, Chris Farquhar, the quarterback at West Potomac, was 20 for 38 for 306 yards and two touchdowns. Wow. Also ran for 125 yards and three touchdowns. Lalich, a very highly rated quarterback, as we know, know UVA bound, uh, 26 of 38 for 450 <laughs> yards and four touchdowns. Wow. Uh, the, I mean, the numbers speak for themselves. You had A.J. Johnson, the running back at West Springfield, go 159 yards on the ground and four touchdowns, all of them in the first half. Okay, so those of you at home folks that just tuned in, this is not season stats for these players. This is a game that happened this past weekend between Single two teams game. that went to four overtimes, 81 to 74. Mirza, I gotta ask you, West Springfield, a team that came into this year highly rated in our Connection Newspapers poll. They've got UVA's future quarterback in Peter Lalich guy that's had incredible numbers over the years. Here he is as a senior. They lose a game 81 to 74 to a team in West Potomac. Let's be honest here, they're not really world beaters. Uh, let, let me tell you something. I talked to a coach runner before this game. I had a question for him after last week's performance. 
West Springfield got their first win of the season, beating Fairfax 49-41. And my question was, you have a great offense, obviously. How did you give up 41 points? Right. Uh, you know, that was only half of what they gave up this <laughs> week. But uh, before last week's game, before this week's game, before they lost to West Potomac, the offense was averaging 28 points per game, which was tied for the best average in the Patriot District. The defense was giving up more than 37 points per game, the worst, off wow. the worst uh, average in the Patriot District. The defense gave up 34 points in their first game against uh, Stonebridge, 35 against Edison, 39 against Annandale, 41 against Fairfax. If you look at those teams, the schedule got easier, but the points got higher. Right. And then you give up 81 points against West Potomac. Uh, you know, I, I didn't even bother to calculate the averages. Yeah. I'm mm -hmm. not that good at math. Yeah, <laughs> but I'm, I'm going to assume now that they're still the lowest ranked team in, in giving up points right. um, in the district. And, and folks, we could do the math, but I'm sure that it's not that great in the region either. You know, it says a lot about defense, especially at the high school level. Everybody loves the guy that can throw for, you know, 300 yards in a game, and everybody loves the running back, and the line never gets glory. Defense wins championships. We've heard it. It's a cliche, but it's true. And a team that is so offensively gifted, um, it's a shame that there isn't an opportunity for them to progress their season, especially in their district, in a Patriot district, that is a difficult, more difficult district and more fun district mm -hmm. than it's been in years. Um, you know, it's unfortunate they don't, they don't get a chance to progress their season. I talked a little bit to Coach Renner about, um, about that, and he said, you know, the defense is still a young defense. They lost three to four uh, people who would have been starting in that defense in very key positions. Um, he's saying, you know, they're learning, they're getting better every game. The scores don't indicate it, but that's what he said. Yeah. And, um, you know, he's saying one of these games are going to make a huge stop for us. They didn't do so this week. I don't know. We'll see about next week's. But. 81 to 74, folks, four overtimes. West Potomac beats West Springfield in the highest scoring game in the Virginia High School League's history ever, ever, ever. It was on ESPN, by the way. I just thought that'd be a little fact that you folks know. It was know. also on the Fairfax Sports Report. Hey, but it was on the FSN, so who cares about this? Exactly. ESPN, we speak <laughs> Never of. heard of it. <laughs> okay, folks, let's, uh, let's move on, of course, to some other teams that are deserving of some talk. Annandale is a team that has just jumped back. They did it last year. They went 0-2 to start the season and then went undefeated the rest of the way through their district. They're 3-0 and in their district. They're up at the top of the standings. Nathan Cartagena is a guy that just tears it up uh, over there for Annandale. He's a, a quarterback that plays his heart out. I saw him in the playoff game against Oakton last year, and I'm assuming that if he keeps doing what he's doing and the Patriot District continues to load up on power points, uh, Annandale might see a playoff berth again this year. One of the top runners and top passers. Cartagena, so that's, that's, a, that's a great guy right there. Here's a the, Lee. I got to hear about Lee. That's a team that has just inc inc incredibly jumped to the forefront of that district and a team that hasn't been that way in several years. Well, l let me just tell you that Lee's, you know, 3-2 and two at this moment. Uh, their two losses have come to Edison, a 5-0 and o team, and Herndon, while Herndon was still on the rise, right. a regional contender. Um, you know, th they've won two games in a row now both very tight games. They beat a really good South County team, 7-6, to six, and then they go and beat T.C. Williams, a perennial good team, 21-18. to 18. Uh, The team, like we said, is on the rise. They play Hayfield next week. That should be another win for them. And they're, all of a sudden, they're 4-2, and 3-0 and in the Patriot District, and they're flying. Uh, they have good passing, good rushing. They have big boys in the, you know, in the front lines, both offense and defense. They, they can do the whole the whole nine, they can go the whole nine yards as long as they keep everything together and they don't make mistakes and lose focus. Chris Oderson, a quarterback that's just impressing people, and you've got a guy in Sean Holston as well who's a speedy guy, state title winner in, in track. So you've got speed and you've got a, a capable quarterback and you've got a great running back as well. Brandon Cameron, right. Correct. So that's a team that's got those glamorous positions that we just talked about. But they also have a defense to back it up, and that's the difference there in that Patriot district. want to quickly touch on South County and Lake Braddock before we jump into the next district. South County, got to ask you about Garrett Watson, right? That's a kid that can, that can just kick his head off. I, I've never seen a high school kicker that can do that. 49-yard field goal against Lee. I mean, what, what, what else could you ask for in a high school kicker? Yeah, I've, I've talked about this before, you know, Coach Bendorf saying if we get to the 30-yard line, we can score a field goal. That isn't a case in, <laughs> in most high school games. Um, yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a great up player, and they have, they have the offense to get him right. into those positions. Good. So. 
Uh, Lake Braddock played South County this week, and they did beat them in South County's first official homecoming. It was a last-minute uh, pass from Shane Hanley, the quarterback over at Lake Braddock, and um, it came after a questionable pass interference call. You know, I'm not sure that South County shouldn't have won that game, but not taking anything away from Lake Braddock. Big guys up front, and they, they can run the ball all day long. Did you say last second pass from the quarterback? Last minute pass. Last minute pass from the quarterback. What a way to, uh, to, to spoil a homecoming there. Right? That, is, that is true. Okay, guys, hey, we want to post our top ten poll one more time and let you folks see what we think are the top teams in the region. And of course, we're going to get a chance to talk a little bit about that pesky national district. Uh, then you see our one through ten there, guys. Email us. Uh, if you go online, you can find our emails. You can also email us at comments at fairfaxsportsnetwork.com. Um, let us know what you think about our top ten and, of course, our coverage of the Northern Region sports. I want to throw quickly up on the screen the National District's uh, standings at the, at the current uh, time. These are current as of today, October 11th. Edison, 5-0, has the potential to go undefeated. Loudoun Valley, a sleeper there in that in this region. You see Loudoun Valley lost to Parkview and Stonebridge. It's only two losses. They should be a great team in this district. Parkview is a team out of the AA in Loudoun that is one of the highest ranked teams PowerPoint wise. I believe they have over 24 PowerPoints. They could beat most AAA Northern Region teams. Derek Dudinsky, an incredible running back over there. We'll stay with the Northern Region quickly. Falls Church, 2-1 in that district. Yorktown having a great season. Mount Vernon, Wakefield, Washington Lee, and Winless Stewart. Uh, folks, want to quickly talk about Edison. Mirza, give us the rundown. Are they going to go 10-0? They could. They have a tough, tough, tough game this weekend. It is their homecoming, so I'm sure they're going to be pumped up for it. Coach Lewis is going to have him prepared. I think he watches a lot of film. His quarterback, Sean Lloyd, responds to it. They play South County. South County looking to rebound. They were 3-0, now they're 3-2, trying to go 4-2 before they go 3-3. Yorktown after that, 4-1 team. Could be a tough game, but if I had to choose a winner in there, I'd go for Edison. And then they have Loudoun Valley at home. And that if they, if they can go 8-0, for the end of the season, they'll go 10 and up. Heck of a district. Of course, we want to mention that the FSN game of the week, as you saw on our FSN Madden preview of the week, is Centerville at Robinson. Of course, you don't need to go. I mean, you already saw what's going to happen, right? <laughs> Folks, get out to that game. It's got a lot of implications for the postseason. It's be a good one. You can also catch it on Cox Digital Cable On Demand. That's right. We're on demand now. Check out our website for details on how to demand those games to your VCR, DVR, whatever you want to demand them to. I demand we move on to the next FSN uh, game of the week, it, which will re-air on Channel 10 uh, this week. Herndon at Robinson, which was taped on September 29th, runs Saturday at 4.30 and Monday at 3.30 on Cox and Comcast Channel 10. A game 10. that was in great demand. Hey, FSN's on the web, fairfaxsportsnetwork.com. Check us out. Beautiful pictures of Paul Frummel. Woo! CCI Screen Printing, thank you for everything you do. 703-9780-257. Quality Care Ford Service Center, 703-383-6299. And Glow Pucks and Tencent Beer is a heck of a read. Folks, thanks for coming back and joining us. After two weeks of reruns, you've got us back. We're glad to be back. Hopefully no more reruns this year. We're going to bring you all the up-to-date and current everything from around the region. Of course, we'll always have your football. Check us out. Reporters from Connection Newspapers. Go to connectionnewspapers.com. I'm BJ Kubarulis. That's Mirza Crispa Hitch. And this is Paul Frommel. We'll catch you next week. Open like a child's mind.